About a month ago, I began a series on the armor of God. In the first week of the series, I talked about the importance of putting on the whole armor of God. In the second week, I explained how to put on the armor of God. And if you weren't here, you really need to watch that video on our website because every Christian needs to know how to put on the armor of God in order to stand against the wiles of the devil. In the third week, we begin studying the individual pieces of the armor of God. And so far, we've covered the loin belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. Now, because Easter is next week and we'll be starting a new series the week after Easter, I have to finish the last four pieces of armor today, this morning. If I don't get through them, well, we just won't get back to it. So there's no ifs, ands, or buts. We're going to finish the last four pieces of the armor of God. Now, we're not going to go as in-depth as I normally do because of time. Instead, we're just going to hit the high points, and I'm going to make some application and give you the basic information that you need to know. And we're going to start with the shoes of peace. So turn with me, if you would, to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Follow along with me as I read verses 13 through 18. It says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore. Now, do you get the idea that you're supposed to stand? That's been mentioned three times here, and it's actually in the Greek, so it's a good translation. But anyways, stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now, as I told you last week, Paul was imprisoned numerous times, which means he would have been very familiar with the armor of a Roman soldier. And that's probably what he was thinking of when he wrote this passage of Scripture. So as we study each piece of armor, I'll be comparing it to the armor of a Roman soldier at the time of Paul. And that goes for the shoes as well as the shield, the helmet, and the sword. So let's talk about the shoes of a Roman soldier. The Roman soldier's shoe con shoes consisted of two parts. The sandal, and sometimes it was a boot, depending upon the climate. If you were stationed in Britain or maybe in northern Germany, the Germanic uh, people up there, you would not wear sandals in the wintertime. So they didn't just have sandals. We have the tendency to see that because we go back to the time of uh, the Middle East, the time around Jesus, and we look to see what they wore in Israel. Well, because of the climate, most of them wore shoes. But it could also be boots. The second piece of the shoe was called the grieve. Here's a picture of an ancient grieve from the first century around the time of Jesus Christ. You can see those are ancient greaves. Actually, you find that in the museum. But regardless of whether it was a sandal or a boot, their shoes had metal spikes or what we would call cleats one to three inches long. In fact, the cobbler who made the shoes would begin with two small pieces of flat metal with spikes attached to them. And then he would sandwich those two metal plates between two pieces of leather that were cut out in the shape of a soldier's foot. One of the pieces of metal was placed where the ball of the foot would be, and the other was placed at the heel. And then he would stitch those two pieces of, of leather together, forming the sole of the Roman soldier's shoe. Now, if the soldier was stationed in the city, the spikes were one inch long. If he was on the battle line, if he was getting ready to go into the battle, the spikes were three inches long. Now, the spikes had a threefold purpose. First of all, they acted like an athlete's cleat in order to give them traction because you didn't want to slip in the heat of the battle. If you fell to the ground, it was a great possibility that you were going to die because anyone that was laying on the ground, it was just too easy to take a spear or a sword and stab them or step on them because the Roman soldiers were not the only ones that had spikes on the bottom of their shoes. So if you went to the ground nine times out of ten, you were going to end up dead. So they gave you good traction. Secondly, they were used to kick your opponent's shins. Believe it or not, that was a common tactic in hand-to-hand -hand combat, especially against opponents who didn't have the proper armor. And last but not least, they were used to crush the enemy's neck when he had slipped and was on the ground or maybe was wounded on the ground. You didn't want to have to go around doing this, so you just step on their neck and you would kill them as one of the spikes went through the jugular vein. Now, let's talk a little bit about the grieve. 
The grave was a beautifully tooled piece of brass that began at the top of the knee and went all the way down to the top of the foot. And it curved around the sides of the soldier's legs. It looks something like this. Again, here's another picture. You find this in a museum. Now, the main purpose of the grieve was for, for protection. In fact, with their greaves on, a soldier could walk through thorns or briars and never get a scratch. But more importantly, the greaves protected the soldier's shins when they were in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Again, the favorite tactic of a soldier was to kick their opponent in the shins. And what most people don't realize is that a good hard kick would either break the opponent's leg or it would lacerate their shins very severely. And the only protection that they had against that were the greaves. In fact, with the greaves on, you could be repeatedly kicked without actually receiving any type of serious injury. So that's why you always see those soldiers in that period of time, unless they were from what they would consider to be an uncivilized nation with greaves on. So as you can see, the shoes of a Roman soldier were designed to protect, but also to be used as a weapon. With the spikes, you could severely injure your enemy, and at the same time, the greaves protected you from your enemy. Now let's see what Paul had to say about the shoes in God's army. Look back at verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now I want you to underline the word preparation. Preparation is translated from the Greek word het oi masia. And it means to be ready or to be prepared. But more importantly, it's written in the instrumental of means case. Which tells us that being ready to share the gospel is the means by which your feet are shod. In other words, when you're ready to share the gospel, when you're prepared and you're wanting to share the gospel of Jesus, the shoes automatically come into existence and are automatically put on. Now let me ask you a question. Why in the world would Paul liken the gospel of peace to a Roman soldier's killer shoes? Because let's be honest, the whole purpose of having spikes on the, on the uh, bottom of your feet was so that you could severely injure your opponent. So why in the world would Paul liken the gospel of peace to a Roman soldier's killer shoes? Because most of us would never do that. In fact, for most of us, that would never even cross our mind. Because when we think of the gospel, we think of feet, what do we think of? We think of verses like Isaiah chapter 52, verse number 7. Look at that scripture. Notice what it says. How beautiful on the mountain are the feet of the messenger who brings good news. Or in other words, the gospel. The good news of peace and salvation. The news that the God of Israel reigns. Now, the reason we think that way is because we see things from the perspective of the person being saved. From the perspective of the person who's hearing the gospel for the very first time. But Paul is seeing this from a different perspective. Because Paul knows that there is a spiritual battle that takes place in the spiritual realm when we begin to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a battle between angelic forces and demonic forces. And the shoes in God's armor are designed to crush the enemy and free the captive. You see, the gospel does two things. And you always need to remember this. Number one, it crushes Satan's power over individuals. And number two, it sets the captives free. So from Satan's perspective, the gospel is very deadly. But from the captive's perspective, the gospel is liberating. Now listen to me. We can never forget that the gospel of peace crushes the enemy. Most of us never think that way because when we think of the gospel, we always see it from our perspective. When we first heard the gospel and we responded to it. But you see, we forget about the, the perspective of Satan. To Satan, it's destroying him. It's crushing him. In fact, turn to Romans chapter 16, verse 20, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. It says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Do you see that? The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. You see, the only way that God can bring peace to this world and to individuals is to crush the one who's responsible for all of the upheaval in this world and also the upheaval in individuals' lives. And who's the person that's responsible for that? Satan. Satan is the person who's responsible for that. So as I said, from Satan's perspective, the gospel is very deadly. But from the captive's perspective, the gospel is liberating. But let's make a little bit of an application here. Because we're talking about spiritual warfare. And normally when we think about spiritual warfare, it's because the enemy is attacking us. Maybe he's attacking our finances. Maybe he's attacking our marriage. Maybe we're having problems at work. And you know, really, we've done nothing wrong. 
We have good work ethics. We're doing exactly what we're supposed to, but you're having problems at work. And many times we say, you know, I'm under spiritual attack. But here's normally what we do when we're under spiritual attack. Normally we withdraw inside of ourselves. And we become an in introvert instead of an extrovert. And what we do is we go, oh God, look at me. I'm having such a horrible time. But what we forget is that we need to go on the offensive. And one of the best ways to go on the offensive when you're being attacked by the enemy is start sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. But here's what's sad. Most of us never think of that. When we're going through an attack, we're not going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. All we can think about is ourselves. But you know, the truly mature Christians, it doesn't matter what attack they're going through, they're still very prepared and very ready to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I always think about my mother. When my mother started getting sick, you know, I really thought, you know, she'd all be concerned about herself, but she wasn't. What she was concerned about was the church and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, you know, because of what my mother had, she started having hallucinations. And so she would think something happened that really didn't happen. I can remember one time, my dad and my mom came to my house. and My dad said, would you tell her something didn't happen? And I said, well, mom, what is it? And she thought someone had called her from the radio station and they were, in a sense, talking with her and she said something that might have been a reproach to the church. And it was just eating her up. She said, Alan, I would never do anything. I said, Mom, I know you wouldn't do that. But here's what was interesting about my mom. No matter how bad she got, and of course she began to deteriorate at the end, she was still thinking about the souls of others and how to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want you to understand, even though she, the ultimate victory came, of course, when she passed away and now she's with Jesus, but I want you to understand, she was still witnessing to people. If you want to be what God wants you to be, when you're under a spiritual attack, you have to forget about what's happening to you, and you have to be ready to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, some of you are always complaining that people are talking about you or spreading rumors about you or people are stabbing you in the back. Oh, get over it. You want that to happen? Become a pastor. I'm serious. You know... I didn't grow up in a pastor's home, and I thought when I became a pastor, I thought everyone was going to love me because I'm going to share the gospel, I'm going to help people, and I found out just the opposite is true. Most of the people have roast pastor for lunch after Sunday sermon. Yeah. And when people get upset and they leave, they go up and they tell all sorts of things, and people who have never even attended my church are saying things about us. You know, I learned that early on. And here's what I learned. I learned if people aren't calling you a cult, you're probably not doing what you're supposed to be doing. It's amazing what goes around. How many of you heard that Cornerstone Fellowship's a cult before you started coming to our church? Yeah, go ahead and raise your hand. See all those hands? Yeah, I had a person come up to me one time, and they said, yeah, I heard if you come to your church and become a member, we, they have to show you W-2 forms. What? <laughs> what? All kinds of, of rumors go out. I had a person that came to see me about six months ago, and he'd been coming to my church for about six months, and I've learned more at your church than I've learned in all my years as a Christian. And he said, but I want you to understand, when I first came here, he said, my ex-pastor came to see me and said, you need to stop going to that church because they're deceiving you. They're going to lead you astray. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, there's probably no other in church in town that is talked about like Cornerstone Fellowship. And I, I don't understand that. But I learned early on that I don't worry about that. When under the attack, don't worry about that. You just keep sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And let me tell you something that's great about our church. Almost every service, we have someone who's one to Jesus Christ. And sometimes we'll have three or four, and sometimes we'll have seven or eight people who will raise their hand to accept Jesus Christ. Now, I grew up in the Baptist church, and I'll be honest with you. If we saw one person walk down the aisle in a month, we thought, man, did you see? We had a person saved. And you know, now we see people saved all the time, but I'll tell you why. It's because we teach the Word of God. But I'm here to tell you when you're under spiritual attack, you need to still be ready and prepared to share the gospel of Jesus because they are killer shoes to the enemy. And if you just keep on going, I want you to understand, those things will just roll right off of you. Now, Let's look at the next piece of God's armor, which is the shield of faith. So turn with me to verse 16 in Ephesians chapter 6. It says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, as I told you last week, the Roman soldiers were issued two different types of shields. 
One was for public parades and ceremonies, and it was called an aspis. The other was for battle, and it was called the thurios. Now, the shield that Paul is referring to is the thurios. It was four foot long by two and a half feet wide, and it was shaped just like a door, which is interesting because the Greek word thurios is derived from the Greek word thura, which literally means door. So it aptly describes what a Roman soldier's shield looked like. Now, with this large of a shield, a Roman soldier could completely cover himself from the aerial assaults of the enemy. And if you understand the battle tactics back then, you would literally have your army line up and you would face the other army's battle line. And, and what was interesting is you began to march towards each other. The archers on each side would shoot arrows. And when you saw those arrows coming, I'm telling you, there could be so many, it would almost blacken the sky, make it dark. And the only thing you could do is actually get down on your knee, put your shield up, and their shield was so large it completely covered them when they were under an aerial assault. Now, as I said last week, the shield had an iron frame and was composed of six layers of animal hides treated in a special way to make it as strong as steel. The middle of the shield had a metal boss at the center of it because that was its weakest spot, its weakest point. And this eliminated any weakness and made it almost impenetrable. Now, in verse 16, Paul said that the shield of faith is able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Look back at verse 16, you'll see what I'm talking about. It says, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, what in the world are fiery darts? Well, the word darts is translated from the Greek word belos, which, der which is derived from the Greek verb balo, which means to throw. So belos refers to anything aerial, such as arrows, javelins, or darts. But most of the time, it referred to arrows. Now, Thucydides was a Greek historian who lived about 400 B.C. And his writings revealed that there were three types of arrows that armies used around the Mediterranean Sea. In fact, let me explain something about the people who lived in the Middle East around the Mediterranean Sea. That was the cradle of civilization. In fact, if you go back and you study these ancient empires, they were the most advanced empires in the world. I'll give you an example. When you go to some of the museums over there in the Middle East, maybe you go to Israel, you're going to Jordan, or you're going to Egypt, you go into these museums and you'll see certain pieces of equipment that are 3,000, 4,000 years old and you can't believe it. You're thinking, how in the world did they do that? How in the world did they build the pyramids at the time of Abraham? In fact, they were actually built before Abraham. How many of you know that? The pyramids of Giza, Cheops? Yeah. I, I like to ask this question. I will say things like this. When Abraham went to Egypt, did he see the pyramids? And most people go, oh, I don't know. Yes, he did. They were built at that time. When Moses, he saw the pyramids. When Jesus' parents, Joseph and Mary, took him to Egypt... There were the pyramids. They saw the pyramids. They saw those things. And when you look at the things that the, uh, these ancient civilizations had, the houses they lived in, people, they didn't live in huts. They lived in houses. Now, you go over there today and you think, man, they're so backward. They're third world countries. What in the world happened to them? Does anyone know? Islam. Islam. Islam is built on 7th century nomadic tribe customs and culture from Saudi Arabia. They still wipe their hand with they say well still wipe their butts with their left hand. That's the way it is. In fact, if you go to Egypt today, you never hand anything with your left hand because that's an insult. Why? You wipe with your left and you eat with your right. Yeah. But the reason they're so backward when at one time they were advanced is because of Islam. But here's what I want you to understand. Thucydides was a Greek historian who lived about 400 BC. And his writings reveal that there were three types of arrows that were used by the armies that were around the Mediterranean Sea. The first arrow were, were plain arrows, just like our arrows today. They had metal tips. Yeah. Some of you enjoy going and, and finding arrowheads today, and you find one and it's all chipped out. And you go, oh, look at the arrowhead. It's probably 300 years old. Isn't that sad? Because 4,000 years ago, the Persian Empire, the Greeks... The Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, they had metal. Their arrows had metal tips. So you had arrows with metal tips just like our arrows today. The second type were flame arrows. They would dip them in tar, 
and then they would light them on fire and shoot them. The third were arrows that were filled with combustible fluid, uh, a combustible fluid sealed and then shot. Now, these combustible arrows were made from slender pieces of cane that were hollowed out, and they were filled, as I said, with a combustible fluid, and then they were sealed with wax or clay, and then they were shot. And when they hit, they would scare the crap out of you because they exploded on impact. Now, to the natural eye, they look like a plain arrow. So when the enemy would shoot these arrows, they'd be, oh, there's just an arrow, I'll put my shield up. But when they hit, they exploded like a bomb. Now, these fluid-filled arrows were not used in normal combat situations. They were reserved for use against the fortified positions of the enemy. That's when they brought out these type of arrows. But here's what's interesting. Paul's word usage in the Greek is identical to Thucydides. So this is what Paul was talking about when he said fiery darts. Yes. Now, people, this is really applicable to us as it pertains to spiritual battles that we face as Christians. I want you to think about this. How many times does it look like the devil is throwing something small at you? Oh, yes, this is an attack of the enemy, but, you know, it doesn't look very big. And before you know it, it explodes into something major. In other words, it looks like a normal attack, and then it explodes into something much larger. Well, Paul says that the shield of faith is able to quench the fiery darts. Now, that word quench is translated from the Greek word spinumi, and it means to extinguish or to put out. And that's what faith does. It puts out or it extinguishes the fire. But here's what you need to understand. It does not stop the explosion. It does not stop the explosion. All it does is it puts out or extinguishes the fire and it protects you from getting harmed. Now, what am I saying on this? Here's what I'm telling you. Maybe at work, you know, someone spreads a rumor and you think, well, you know, this is just a little thing. And then you find out that everyone knows about it and your boss calls you in. So it was something that you thought that was small and being attacked and all of a sudden exploded in something bigger. Here's what you need to understand. God has given you the shield of faith. And the purpose of the shield is to extinguish the fire and to protect you from harm. But it does not stop the initial explosion. Everyone get that? Because there are some people that think because they're a Christian, everything's going to be roses. Well, honey, I want you to understand to have roses, there's got to be a lot of fertilizer. So crap will happen in your life. But here's what you need to understand. When those things hit and it explodes and it seems to be much larger than what you thought, you know, you got a letter from the IRS and now they send you a second letter and they've seized your accounts and you're being audited. Oh my gosh, how did it explode into this? And you're going, everyone, you're crying. This is when you take the shield of faith. You take what, your word, what the Word of God says and you realize that faith will quench the fire and protect you from harm. But it doesn't stop the explosions from happening. That's good teaching, Pastor Allen. Now let's look at the next piece of armor, which is the helmet of salvation. So turn with me, if you would, to verse number 17 in Ephesians chapter 6. It says, and take... The helmet of salvation. Now, I want you to underline the word salvation. Salvation is translated from the Greek word soterion. But more importantly, it's written in the ablative of source case, which means that salvation is the source of the helmet. In other words, the moment you get saved, the helmet comes into existence and it's automatically put on. And as a result of that, you now have what Paul refers to as a saved mind. Let me say that again. You now have what Paul calls a saved mind. In fact, turn with me, if you would, to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse number 7, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. It says, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, I want you to underline that phrase, sound mind. Sound mind is translated from the Greek word sophronismos, or I should say this, sophronismos. That's about the best way I can pronounce it. Now, sophronismos is a compound word. That simply means that it's made up of more than one word. In this case, it's made up of two words. It's made up of the word so, which means whole 
or health. In fact, so is a common stem in the Bible. It's the stem for the word soteria, which means salvation, soter, which means savior, and sozo, which means saved. Now, hopefully you've noticed that all three of these words deal with the act of saving. And that's because the stem so indicates the act of saving us from anything that jeopardizes our health or what the Bible would call wholeness. So it's usually translated as saved. So what is so? What does the stem so mean? It means saved. The second word is franeo. And franeo refers to the mind. So when you combine these two words, it literally means saved mind. So notice what Paul is telling Timothy. He says, for God has not, hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a saved mind. So if I were you, I would open up my Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 7, and I would cross out that phrase, sound mind, and I would write, write above it, saved mind, because that's what it literally says. Now, you won't understand what Paul is saying unless you understand the background of this book. So let me give you a little bit of background information that you need to know. Timothy pastored in the city of Ephesus, and it was the very first mega church in the world outside of Jerusalem. Yeah. Scholars think, they believe, that his church had over 25,000 members. Now, people, the population of Tahlequah is 15,600, somewhere in there. It's going to go up by the year 2020 to around 20,000. But here's what I want you to understand. Even if it goes up to 20,000, he had over 25,000 members in his church. So Paul wrote the book of 1 Timothy to Timothy to teach him or to tell him and to give him some instruction on how to administrate this large, growing megachurch because Timothy was a young man. And he has all of these members and he's kind of overwhelmed. So Paul writes the book of 1 Timothy to instruct him on how he should administrate his church. That's why they're called the pastoral epistles. Yeah, they're good advice to how to administrate a church. Now... Shortly after Paul wrote the book of 1 Timothy, persecution began. And Timothy's mega church just crumbled. He went from a church of over 25,000 members to a church under 100. Can you imagine having a church of over 25,000 members and then persecution begins and you have a church of less than 100? And almost all of his leaders left the church. And even Timothy was fearful for his life. But he was also bitter at his leaders because he felt like they had deserted him. And that's why Paul wrote the book of 2 Timothy. So in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 7, Paul told Timothy, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a saved mind. In other words, Paul told Timothy, quit your stinking thinking. God's given you a saved mind, so start using it. Quit thinking the way the world thinks and start thinking the way that God's Word tells you to think. You see, a saved mind doesn't mean that God supernaturally renews your mind when you get saved. It's not like all of a sudden when you get saved, whoa, I just think like Jesus thinks. No. You have to renew your mind because God doesn't do it for you. In fact, turn to the book of Romans chapter 12, uh, verses, verse 2, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Very familiar passage of Scripture. Paul is writing this, and he says, And be not conformed to this world. The problem is, most of you are conformed to this world. You think like the world thinks. You think that success is all about money and prestige and power and being popular or whatever it is. You think that's what success is all about? Of course, Jesus comes along and he says that it's not. He says, life is not about material things. Yeah. So he tells them, don't be conformed to this world, but be you transformed. Now, how are you transformed? By the renewing of your mind. Why do you want to be transformed? So that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see that word prove? It's translated from the Greek word diakrino, and it literally means to make a distinction between. So the whole reason we're supposed to renew our mind is so that we can make a distinction between the acceptable, the good, and the perfect will of God. See, some of you just want to know the will of God. 
Well, you're a babe. I don't just want to know the will of God. I want to know the distinction between the acceptable will of God and the perfect will of God. Most of you have settled for the acceptable will of God. And that's why your life is kind of... Mm. I want the perfect will of God. But the only way I can make a distinction between the acceptable will of God and the perfect will of God is not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of my mind so that I can make a distinction between the acceptable, the good, and the perfect will of God. So, what is a saved mind? I still haven't told you what a saved mind is. Well, let me see if I can explain it to you. Before you were saved, your mind was blind to the truth of God's word. But now that you're saved, your mind has been opened to the truth. So a saved mind is a mind that's no longer blind to the truth, but now it's able to see the truth of God's word. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, and you'll see what I'm talking about. It says, if the gospel we preach is hidden, it's hidden from the people who are lost. You know, I can't understand why everyone in the world is not saved. You want to know why? Because salvation determines where you're going to spend eternity. And we are going to die. There's not a person out here that's not going to die. Hey, I've got news for you. You're going to die. Unless Jesus comes back before. But if not, men is appointed once to die. But there's all these people who aren't saved. Why aren't they saved? Well, let's just keep reading. If the gospel we preach is hidden, it's hidden from the people who are lost. Satan, who is the god of this world hath blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the gospel. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ who is the exact likeness of God. So as you can see, those who are lost are blind to the truth. But those who are saved are no longer blind to the truth, but they're able to see the truth of God's word. So that's what Paul was telling Timothy. He was telling Timothy that God has given him a saved mind, a mind that can see the truth. He said, wake up, Timothy. God's not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of saved mind. All these lost people, they're blind to the truth. But you have a saved mind. You need to renew your mind because you can see the truth of God's word. So, salvation opens our mind to the truth. And truth is what protects our mind from the lies of the enemy and from the stinking thinking of this world. And that's why it's referred to as the helmet of salvation. People, it protects our mind and it protects our thought process. But that's why so many of you, you get attacked by the enemy. Ooh, you're kind of like Timothy. Everything's going to hell in a handbasket. No, it doesn't matter what happens to you. I want you to understand something. You are a child of God, and you have the promises that God's word says you have. You need to quit your stinking thinking, quit being conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and start walking in God's word. And pretty soon, that shield of faith comes back up. Pretty soon, you have on the shoes, well, I like to call killer shoes of the gospel. You're going to crush the enemy as you prepare, or uh, as you share the gospel with others. Now, let's look at the last piece of armor, which is the sword of the Spirit. So turn back to verse 17 of Ephesians chapter 6, and let's read that again. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, most people, after reading this verse, think that the sword of the Spirit is the Bible. How many of you have ever heard a pastor say, and take the sword of, your, of the Spirit, the Word of God? Anyone ever heard that? Yeah. Most of us, after reading this verse, think that the sword of the Spirit is the Bible. But that, because that's what it seems to say. But people, it's not saying that. And let me explain how I know that. First of all, in the original Greek, there is no definite article before the phrase, Word of God. That means it should have been translated, A Word of God, not the Word of God. Yeah. Secondly, God is in the ablative of source case, which means it should have been translated from God, not of God. So if you have your Bible, here's what I want you to do. I want you to cross out the word of, and I want you to write above it the word from. So a literal, literal translation would read something like this. 
And the sword of the Spirit, which is a word from God. Wow. As I've told you before, 99% of the Bible you can read in English or whatever language that you speak, and you can understand it. But there's about 1% of the Bible that if you can't read the original languages, the meaning is kind of lost. And this is one of those times. Because we translated it as the Word of God, when really what it says, the original is, and the sword of the Spirit, which is a word from God. And last but not least, that term word is translated from the Greek word rhema, not logos. You see, when you're talking about the Bible as the Word of God, you always use the word logos. People, this is the Word of God. This is the logos of God. So when you're talking about the Word of God as the Bible, you always use the word logos. You never use the word rhema. You see, a rhema is a word that God quickens in your spirit. In other words, it's when God speaks to you, either through a particular Bible verse, or maybe through what the pastor is saying, or maybe you're doing your quiet time, and you're reading the Bible, or you're praying, and all of a sudden, God just drops this word into you, and it's like God was speaking to you. People, that's a rhema. It's God speaking to you, personally. And that's what the sword of the Spirit is. The sword of the Spirit is a rhema from God. It is a word that God has quickened in your spirit. Now, whenever you're in a spiritual battle, a rhema, for, rhema from God is always exactly what you need to overcome and be victorious. Yeah. If you're being hit by the enemy, and you're going to the Lord in prayer, and you're praying about this, one of the things you should be praying is, God, give me a rhema, speak to me what I should do, what I should say. Lord, give it to me. And you'd be surprised the number of times you'll open up your Bible and there'll just be a verse, or he'll just say one word to you, or he'll speak to you. That's a rhema. So, whenever you're in a spiritual battle, a rhema from God is always exactly what you need to overcome and be victorious. In fact, let me give you two examples to illustrate what I'm talking about. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Acts, chapter 14, verses 8 through 10. While they were at Lystra, one of the most exciting places to ever visit is Turkey. You want to know why? Turkey is the second holy land. Most of us don't know that. But in the early church, here's what's interesting. All of Paul's missionary journeys went through Turkey. The seven churches in Revelation, the seven churches of Revelation, are all in Turkey. Yeah. Guess where Lystra is? Modern day Turkey. So notice what it says. While they were at Lystra, Paul and Barnabas came upon a man with crippled feet. You could tell right away. You could look at his feet and you could say, something is wrong with his feet. He had been that way from birth, so he had never walked. He was sitting and listening as Paul preached, looking straight at him. Paul realized he had faith to be healed, so Paul called to him in a loud voice, Stand up! And the man jumped to his feet, and he started walking. God spoke to Paul, telling him that the man had enough faith to be healed. So Paul told him to stand up, and bam! He was healed. In other words, Paul received a rhema. Now, technically, this was a word of knowledge. Everyone knows what a word of knowledge is, right? We have different gifts. You have the motivational gifts and you have the manifestation gifts. The motivational gifts are referred to in the book of Romans. And they tell you the things, these gifts that every one of us has that motivates us to do what we do. Lisa's motivational gift is serving. She likes to serve me. I like to be served. We're very compatible. My motivational gift is teaching. I like to teach. So I bore Lisa, but because she's a server, she listens to me as I preach sermons at home. So we're very compatible. Everyone see that? Those are motivational gifts. 
But then Corinthians tells us that there are something that's called the manifestation gifts. They're manifestations of the Spirit. Those are the gifts that if you're from the Assembly of God or the Pentecostal, you're very familiar with those gifts. Those are the gifts like the gift of prophecy, the gift of word of knowledge, the gift of word of wisdom, the gift of faith, the, the gifts of healings, the gift of miracles. Those are the manifestation gifts. Those things happen as the Spirit wills. So the motivational gifts, they affect your personality. They affect who you are. You know, it kind of motivates you. That's why they're called motivational gifts. Motivates you to do what you do. The manifestation gifts, they're as the Holy Spirit wills. They're these supernatural gifts that we talk about. Well, technically, what Paul received was a word of knowledge. In other words, he knew something that he had no way of knowing in the natural. He knew that this man had the ability or had the faith to walk. So here he is preaching, he looks at this man and he's been looking at him and all of a sudden God just drops in his spirit. He tells him, this man has enough faith to be healed. And so he looks at that man and says, stand up! The man stands up and he walks around. But here's what I want you to see. Even though technically it's a word of knowledge, the reason that Paul knew it is because God told him. God told him. So it was a rhema. But it was a rhema for that specific, specific situation. When God speaks to you, it will always be for a specific situation. There have been times that God has spoken to me, times that God has spoken to my wife. In fact, I can remember one time we were in church and God didn't speak to me on this because I'm ready to preach and I'm concentrating on the word of God. But all of a sudden, my wife just knew Macy's in danger. Now, this was the time that we were doing three services. We were doing a Saturday night service an 8 o'clock or a 9 o'clock service and an 11 o'clock service. And so we're getting ready to start the 11 o'clock service. Macy had gone to the Saturday night, so she stayed home, and Lisa had asked her to water the flowers. And so something just hit, and, and, and God told Lisa, said, Macy's in danger, you need to pray. So she just prayed in the Spirit, didn't tell me, she didn't want to worry me. I got up there and preached. We're going home, and she said, something just told me to pray for Macy, and so I was praying, if you... Look like I wasn't paying attention to you. I wasn't because I was praying. So I'm not going to say anything to Macy. I don't want to scare her. So we get home, and Macy says, Mom, Dad, something strange happened this morning. Said, I went out to water the, the flowers, and there was a person parked in the park in a van. And he was just staring at me. And he got out and was staring at me. And I felt uncomfortable. So I turned off the water, and I didn't want to act like I was scared, and I walked, and I got in, and I locked the door. He said, I went upstairs, and I looked out the window, and said, he was going from the side to side, it looked like he was looking at something else. And then he gets in his van, and he slams the, the, the steering wheel, and he drove off. I said, Mom, that scared me. Of course, Lisa tells me the story. But you see, God speaks to us. He gives us ramus for the specific situation. Now, let me give you a second example as an illustration. Look with me, if you would, in Acts chapter 16, verse 16, 16 through 18. Now, it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us, who brought her master's much profit by fortune-telling. She's dealing with familiar spirits, that's why. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Now, we think, why in the world would she do that? Well, you need to understand something. In the original Greek, it doesn't say the way of salvation. It's no definite article there. She was proclaiming a way of salvation. See, back then they taught that there were many ways, just like they do today, to the mountain of God. There's many ways to get to heaven. So she was saying, oh, this is a man of God. He's preaching you a way to heaven. See, Paul had allowed this to go on for several days. And then notice what happens. This is verse 18. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. God spoke to Paul and told him that the girl was possessed by a demon. He'd been allowing this demon-possessed girl to follow him around. And then he turns around and he knows that she's possessed by a demon because God told him. So he commanded the demon to come out of her and bam, she was delivered. Now again, this was a word of knowledge. Paul knew something that he had no way of knowing in the natural. But the reason he knew it is because God 
told him. So even though it was a word of knowledge, it was also a rhema, and it was for that specific situation. Let me explain the purpose of growing in the Lord. The whole purpose of growing in the Lord is to strengthen your relationship with God to be able to do His will. But there's benefits to knowing God. And one of the benefits is you begin to know God, God begins to speak to you personally. You know, we look at these people in the Bible and we think, man, these are great men of faith. And many of them were. But the Bible tells us in Hebrews, they're just like us. They're men of flesh. So the very things that God did for them, God can do for us. Now, when you're in a spiritual battle, what you need is for God to speak to you. You need a rhema. And when he does, it's a sword in your hand. In that moment, you'll know exactly what to do or say to overcome and be victorious. So it truly is like a sword in your hand, but it's even better. It's a word from God. So when we look at these different pieces of armor and the ones that we covered this morning, we realize that we need every bit of these. We need to have these shoes of peace. We need to be prepared to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And even in the midst of our spiritual battles, we need to be sensitive. We need to be receptive. We need to be prepared and ready to share the gospel of Jesus. Because when we do that, it crushes the enemy. The other thing that we need is a shield of faith. Because sometimes it looks like a little arrow is coming at us and we put that up and then boom, it explodes into something major. The shield does not stop the explosions, but what it will do is it will quench the fire and it will protect you so you can come out of it unharmed. The third thing we need is the helmet of salvation. We need to have a saved mind and think the way the Word of God tells us to think. Because if we don't, we'll believe the lies of the enemy. And as long as you believe the lies of the enemy, you will never be victorious. And last but not least, you need the sword of the Spirit, which is a word from God.